Welcome to Tick Talk Take with Doug Paget, the weekly and sometimes more often podcast from Doug Paget. Today's edition, The Talk. What you're going to hear today was recorded at the Wild Goose Festival in early July. The Wild Goose Festival is a Christian spirituality, music, art gathering in the sweaty hills of North Carolina. And it's a get-together of a bunch of friends of mine and some uh, great movers and shakers in the world of progressive expressions of Christianity. And because of the invitation of Russ Jennings, he invited me to rekindle Doug Padger Radio at Wild Goose Festival during a thing that they call the Goose Cast. So they recorded a number of podcasts. And Russ, nicest guy in the world, such an encourager, has been a big fan of the Doug Padgett radio show in the past and said, please, could you do this? And I was like, oh, okay, okay, I'll do it. Because I like to interview people at the Wild Goose Festival who I think are doing interesting things in the world but don't have a platform as big as the work that they're doing. So I try to create these little spaces. I've done that for five or six years at the Wild Goose Festival to find interesting people and to give them just a little megaphone of a voice there at the festival. So I thought, I'll do this for the Wild Goose Festival. And as it turns out, Russ Jennings flips the tables on me, has me start doing the radio show again, which is a big reason why TikTok Take with Doug Padgett is a living being. It's why it's happening. It's why it exists in the world. Because Russ knew that if I just got a little taste, and you'll hear this in the podcast, that if I just got a little taste of doing the radio show again, it would stir up the podcast. So what you're going to hear over the course of the next hour uh, includes a number of, of friends that I met there. A guy named Stephen, who I just uh, met there at the, at the festival. He has a podcast of his own, so you're going to hear from Stephen. A friend named Ben Corey, who's a writer and blogger and podcaster himself. You're going to hear from our regular co-host of Doug Padgett Radio back in the old days, Victoria peterson Hillicu, the sidekick co-host and poet. You're going to hear from another poet, Michael Toy, who some of you know so well, the legendary Michael Toy. You're also going to meet Liz Swenson. Liz uh, pastors a new church that she's starting called the Wildwood Gathering, and she's the best. I'm a huge fan of Liz. She's great. But the first thing you're going to hear here is Russ giving a little introduction to the studio audience has been brought together there at the Wild Goose Festival. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice is that sound quality is going to be moving around a bit. We go for a full hour, and for some reason, I don't know, their technical capacities, because we're in, in a campground field over there in the Appalachian Mountains, and uh, they don't have the greatest of, of circumstances and equipment. So you're going to hear lots of background noise. At the beginning, Russ is just introducing to the entire crowd, so he's a bit off mic. I tried to raise the volume a little bit so you could hear, because it really sets the context for what we're doing and why TikTok Take with Doug Padgett is now uh, uh, an experience that's happening, because Russ talked to me into it, and got me connected again to my uh, broadcasting um, alter ego. So thank you, Russ, uh, for this. But he's the guy you can blame on uh, for all of this. And then you're also going to notice sometimes, I don't know why, but listening back through the audio recording that happened there, sometimes some of us are only in one ear of a micro of the headphones and not in the other. So you're going to hear sometimes if you're listening with headphones on in left ear, in right ear. I'm not sure why that's going on. But you might, you might find that. But I hope you enjoy it. It's a, it's a fun conversation. It's got lots of energy to it. Uh, great people, Stephen and Ben and Victoria and Michael and Liz and Russ. And uh, we just had a great time. So this is one of the talk versions of TikTok Take with Doug Padgett, the talk edition from Wild Goose. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is podcast history happening before your eyes. And uh, there will be more people who will realize significance of it and come rushing over here the minute we get rolling. Many of you are probably, like me, addicted to Doug Patrick Radio uh, as a podcast, uh, which ceased operation like two years ago, right? Yeah, like 18 months ago. 18 months It's ago. heartbreaking. And, you know, because that, there's so many incredibly important things that, that podcasts are very demanding, and some of you may know. So today we're going to hear the first edition of... Doug Patrick Radio in 18 months, right. and we're all hoping that the addiction process <laughs> will get him back after his uh, is here, I mean, the whole deal. So, let's begin. Let's do it. And let's all right. Down. All right, gentlemen. We're beginning with 
Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Doug Badger Radio. Religious radio, that's not quite right. We used to say broadcasting live out of the Twin Cities. Uh, it's really good to be back. Uh, we're at the Wild Goose Festival, and those of you who are saying to yourself, how in the world did a Doug Padgett radio feed show up in my podcast <laughs> list? Uh, it's because I, uh, I've uh, been talked into... Uh, not not much against my will, I will tell you, to uh, to bring back the radio show at least for a an hour at the at the Wild Goose Festival. Not but making I, any I feel, promises. I, I feel like I've been you know like eighteen months sober, and now I'm uh, <laughs> I'm off the wagon, and this could be it. I might thank you. I might be right back uh, as uh, a radio host. Uh, it's super fun. Sh- uh, joining me is uh, the regular co-host in Doug Badger Radio, Victoria Peterson Hillicue, the poet. Hey, Wild Goose. Hello, Victoria. And we're going to have at least three guests. One of the things that I like to do when we have the Doug Padgett Radio experience at Wild Goose Festival is try to give a voice and platform and interview space to people who we have found around the Wild Goose uh, Festival who are interesting, thoughtful, and uh, people that should be listened to, but because of some variety of reason, didn't get on the schedule. Right. So this is their chance to be uh, uh, part of part of something. So... It makes it sound like you're kind of like left out or like the people that you know, nobody should. Out, so good, good. good. Don't be feel left out. That's, it's, that's not, I didn't mean to make it sound that way. Um, uh, but because sometimes uh, the, uh, festivals like this, the, the same old people tend to get scheduled for saying and doing and leading a lot of things. And uh, the people that you're going to want to be listening to from this day going forward, you haven't yet heard about. So uh, the there's going to be three. There's going to be right. three, passing the baton. Is Give a, up some of your real estate, dude. Is, is it great? I would be glad. I, I'll tell you. I, uh, in fact, I have a couple of properties for sale in Minneapolis. If you're <laughs> interested in that, I'll make a little commercial out of this. A gorgeous corner of 27th and Chicago is for sale in the us. city of Minneapolis, the city of lakes. Uh, so uh, we, we have a couple of guests with us, with us here. And we call this religious radio that's not quite right. Now, Steve, you don't, Steve or Steven? Steve. Steve. Steve is a podcaster himself. And so we're going to get to you in, in a moment. Tell us a little bit about your podcast and uh, what you're doing and, and how you run your podcast. But I'm wondering if you have a little tagline, like we call this religious radio that's not quite right, mm. which I think is super clever. And for no one who's ever heard that before, they should really let that soak in. <laughs> Just how clever of a phrase that is. Uh, not too long, though. We want you to talk soon. Do, do you have a... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a uh, a tagline? Yeah, I mean, I guess we could go with a couple taglines, but the one I really like is the emergence. The, this is going to be a little fudged because it's still developing. Yeah, but no, no, the, I like it. Yep. The, the merger between traditional religion and alternative worship, and where young adults are finding that meaning place. Yeah, mm-hmm. great. Maybe I'm our interested podcast in hearing more from audience you. could help. To help you with your tagline too. Who's that? Oh, the audience. Yeah, we yeah, could crowdsource yeah, this yeah. thing, come up with a tagline. Figure okay. It out. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. a couple other ideas floating around, like spiritual yeah. adventurer. Oh. Yeah, there you I go. Like kinda uh-huh. It's kind of sexy. It's kind of sexy. Yeah. Yeah. But I, other than that, it's, it's a little dry at the moment. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Good. We'll get to that in a minute. Ben, are you doing a podcast yet? We've been talking about this for a couple of years. I feel. Yeah, like. I actually um, have a podcast with Matthew Paul Turner called That God Show. Um, that God Show. <laughs> yeah, right. Back with Benjamin. Right here. Look at that. You have a logo and a shirt shirt and everything. everything. Although we are notorious for not being uh, regularly scheduled. See, this is the thing, isn't it? This is the difficult thing about a podcast. In fact, we call this Doug Padgett Radio, religious radio. That's not quite right. Um, Doug Padgett Radio, because I wanted this to feel more like a radio experience than a podcast experience. Mm -hmm. And that involved two components. One was I didn't want to do a high level of editing that people do in podcasts. (laughs) I like the the live nervousness. I don't do a lot of editing. Editing. That's part. Yeah. So you're not just saying you did it because you're lazy. No, you no, it's a, it. no, it's a commitment to the mm-hmm. the experience where someone doesn't say to themselves, oh, "I'm sorry, can I just restate that?" Because mm-hmm. the best things we say happen in real time, yeah. Yeah. not in prepared time. So that's that that's part number one. And part number two of the radio part, rather than the podcast, calling it a radio show, was that radio shows seem to have this notion that there's a demand that you're going to have uh, a scheduled time. Like, it's going to happen at this time. You turn on that device in your car or in your kitchen, uh, and that show is going to be on. Unlike uh, what I've done when I've done lots of other podcasting, where it's like, when I put one up, then a podcast, Mm -hmm. where I like the demands of that. You and uh, Matthew Paul Turner, one of the three named bloggers, 
is not uh, a regularly scheduled thing. You do it when you get around well, to it. We, we, yeah, mm. we've been talking about doing one every Tuesday because we know that like this is what we want to do, but it's been hard. You know, we've been doing some international traveling, and then I was working on a dissertation and a book and got caught up in yeah. that. So, but our plan moving forward is to have it to be a weekly podcast that comes out on a certain day that you can count on. Excellent. And so I s- promise we'll get our shit together. Good. Good. Right. Wait, can I say shit? Yes. On yes, you yes, can. You can. Yes, you can. It's religious radio. That's not quite right. Perfect. Yeah. So it's sort of the ideal, sort of the ideal f- uh, feature for for je- for just the, such a thing. Well, Victoria, let's check in with you, Victoria. How have you yeah. been in the eighteen months? Have you done anything since the radio show, or have you been sitting around at home just waiting Eating for someone bonbons. to hand a microphone to you? Wishing, longing for the Doug Padgett radio show. No, I've been great. I've been great. I started a job at Solomon's Porch, yes. our church, this church yes. community we have in Minneapolis. I started working as a communications coordinator there. Yeah. I love it. I started doing slam poetry, which was pretty cool, I think. You know, I mean, they let anybody up there, so yeah. it's not like it's a prestigious And for thing, people right? who don't know slam poetry, that's, that's not Perf- a thing where you talk badly about poets that's a <laughs> style of poetry yeah it's a it's performance orient po- oriented poetry yeah. and after you give your thing at a slam they judge you on a scale of one to ten mm. and and the, the it's kind of like being in the olympics only having none of the judges be qualified in the area in which you are <laughs> <laughs> offering yeah. what you're doing yeah. it could be anybody that, holding that up the sounds number like a terrible idea <laughs> well you can't take it too seriously then well you you have a, a piece of poetry you're going to be sharing with us during the yeah, radio show today. I can do Would that. you like us to turn these people into slam poet judges that are that are sitting here with us? Yes. Would you like them to judge you yeah. on a scale of 1 to 10? But Should we invite uh, a couple of them up here when you do your piece and ask them to be uh, uh, one to ten judges? No, I think we. I have a caveat. I think we should do that. Only you can't use numbers. You have to use adjectives of some kind, like oh. sparkly rainbow or pooey, pooey toilet paper. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, they would. They would judge it with at with words. With words. Yeah, because that's how it should be. Oh. Okay. What is numbers? I don't. I don't know. Are, I, th- I thought it know. was a slam poetry thing. Yeah. Uh, are you ready to do that now? Sure. Do you, do, you, do you want a minute? No. To think about this, should I no. should I tell the people that what you do in in poetry when it goes well is you you clap oh, yeah. with the snap? Yeah, you can clap or snap or. All right. Or. Do you want some kind of a special? Do you you want some kind of a special introduction for your slam poetry experience? No. 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 I'll tell you this about it, since you don't know anything about me. That as a um, white mom, I'm raising two transracially adopted kids, and so I think about the complexities of racism a lot. And this poem is exploring some of my thoughts about the hybrid identity of my daughter and her future, but it also relates to some of the um, conversations that we've been having here about some of the complications and nuances when we think of racial reconciliation. Mostly it's just me trying to understand myself, really, like everything I write. That's all it is. Can we start with, uh, like, applause, like, oh, yeah, where people y- yeah. snap, snap you into it, like, <laughs> be poets? <laughs> Silence. On a Friday night, when the air was as crisp as a chilled apple, and my daughter was young enough to try to pluck the moon out of the night sky and take a bite, we made our way to the braid shop for the first time. We were excited. Her highly textured hair breaking too much in my uneducated fingers. Her hand slipped into mine as we walked down the street. Women's warm laughter tumbled down the block from the shop the way happiness does on cold evenings. The bell on the shop door rang cheerfully as we entered and 10 black women looked at us and stopped laughing silence. Maybe since my whiteness won't protect my black daughter forever. Silence. Maybe since I can't show her how to become a black woman. Silence. Maybe since I just did not belong there. I wanted to say if you knew were me and knew a baby who needed someone to care for her, wouldn't you do the same? Am I not a better mother than no one? I wanted to say, think what you want about me, but please acknowledge her innocence. She didn't ask for this. I wanted to say, I don't know 
what color my love is, but my fear for her is a black fire. I could, would burn myself to ash for her, and it might not be enough. But I did not say anything as I stood in the door of the shop with the silence pressing the breath out of our chests. Instead, these words pressed against my tongue for so long have become stones. My mouth is full. I can barely speak, so I spit them out like broken teeth. This world is not good enough for the magnificence of my daughter. This world is not good enough for the magnificence of any of our sons and daughters. This world isn't good enough for us yet. There we go. Thank you. So I didn't know I was going to do that poem until this morning. Otherwise, I would have normally tried to have it Memorized? Ready. Yeah, like I could have been more vibrant, but, you know, I did the best I can. So you can take that in consideration. Yeah, I, thought it was, I thought it was excellent. And the title of it is Silence. Yeah. Did you, I when you said silence, that wasn't a command to us. This poem <laughs> is called Silence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, can, I, can I ask you some things yes. about poetry? Because I do yes. this a lot with you. I know that, that yeah, you have so to tolerate this because I, I feel like I never understand poetry, right? So I'm always yeah. poking around at it mm-hmm. like a 12-year-old at, the, at an like anthill. Like a dog returning yeah. to its vomit. Like what, <laughs> what, uh, so, so I want to know a little bit about how this comes together because so often, and poets uh, are doing this really sophisticated thing that feels like magic to the rest of us who don't really understand mm-hmm. what you're doing. So um, let me just ask a couple things about this. When you make a poem like this, do you remember the process? Like, was there a line or two that started as the seedling uh, that grew into this piece? I, w- I do remember this one. It was a lot of free writing, free writing about this experience and free writing about my growing concern about my daughter not being able to find her way in African-American communities because she has a white mom and she doesn't really know or that. And and just having big, big feelings about that and and not knowing what to do for her or how to. Create. So you went from free writing. Yeah, I was just free writing, rewriting the story writing it different ways trying it and as therapy for you as as processing for because you wanted to be poetry i knew i was going to write a poem about it you did so at some point you had an experience yep. uh, not just at the braid shop but overall yep. and you're like i'm going to respond to this via poetry yeah and sometimes it happens where I go to us like I listen to some slam poetry or go to a slam and then it triggers an idea or an uh. emotion or a or a, an experience and it has a lot of weight heft and and bigness around it and then I kind of write my way into it and then eventually it got to where this poem is a little bit different in that it's kind of operating on the page as much as performance which isn't always the case like most performance things aren't necessarily a, they're, they're not the same as a page beat whereas this is has stanzas and tercets and so there were things I was doing on the page too and working with threes that are more s- a hybrid kind of thing mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. now that I think about it would be cool if I planned mm-hmm. that since mm-hmm. I'm talking about hybrid identities mm-hmm. but I didn't that just happened by accident so at some point it comes together in that form which has I don't know a dozen stanzas something like that right yeah um, I guess and yeah Go ahead. So it, it's all come together. And then if people could see your sheet, there's crossed out words and new words written on there. Yeah. Does it, it, it stays alive. Like it stays a, li- a living thing. Yeah. These pieces of work like this. Yeah. So it would be like, usually there'll be three or four. Once the shape, the organic shape starts to emerge, then there might be three or four drafts in the notebook before they it spends a significant time there before it comes onto the paper and then when it comes to the paper there still can be significant content revisions but yeah I just changed I I mean I literally just was talking to my friends in the van while we were driving over here oh what poem should I do at the Doug Padgett radio here's what I have and my one friend who comes to a lot of slams with me said oh do that one and I said I don't think I can because I'll cry and then she said well try it out so I read it in the van and I started crying we were crying in the van and I was like I still don't think I can do it but then I just kept practicing and then I changed it you changed were there some cry Today. words you took out or you made them better like I changed them to different words yeah I didn't feel like sometimes you have words there that feel more like they're getting close but they're not there so yeah. they're just like sometimes they're placeholder words because you just don't know what the words are so you just put some there yeah and then sometimes there you just get closer to the truth so you have to See, change this is them. what I find fascinating about 
poetry and talking to poets like you and Michael, who we're going to hear from him in a minute, is like the the way you help non poets into the process of poetry seems like it's so helpful for ways to think about life and spirituality and how we're narr- narrating internally narrating mm-hmm. our own experience in the world like that process that you're having an experience then you're reflecting on it with words then you're working on it then it goes from one level to sort of another level of definition and then from that level of definition it starts to have an effect back on you and then you like that whole thing that's frankly that's what most of us when we experience poetry don't get right like is it because mm-hmm. because it seems like it's all done and together and wrapped up like mm-hmm. i don't know there's something about that i don't know you guys can say anything if you want about but i find that to be so fascinating about the the process and yeah and with the process i'm curious the different aspects of it you go from writing to editing then to reading in front of an audience and which one of those stages do you find let's say let's say most rewarding oh probably the uh, early writing mm. and then the and then the moving it into the form i'm not as much of a fan with the finer details mm. sometimes or even the getting ready for the performance i like when i can perform something i i I, there's something I like about that, like interacting in an audience that way, like we're doing now. But the when it has to be kind of in a stationary state, fixed, so that I can learn it well enough to perform, mm. that's probably my least favorite part. Oh, so I I like it always to be, and then I like to set like this poem I haven't done in a while, and so it's been set aside for a while. Then I like that to have a poem. Then it sometimes becomes more clear what some of the mm. words need to change to. Mm. So I wouldn't be surprised if I don't revise it a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Should we ask people if they have any adjectives that, that they want to <laughs> say know. about it? I think that was a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> now that I think about You're it. rethinking that one? you going to re-edit that one before that goes on paper? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, I give it a seven. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> I'll give it a seven. I'll tell, how strong, would I tell you a six s- week seven. How would I tell you a cute story about <laughs> judging instead of judging? How about that? All right. I went to my son's class once and did some poems, and they wanted to hear about slam poems. So I did poems for them, and I explained the process. And at the end, they all of their own volition held up little pieces of paper with scores on them, like oh. 21.3. I oh, guess I didn't explain the 10 point yeah, scale. Yeah. And it was <laughs> the cutest thing ever. Yeah, yeah the fifth grade yeah. class. Funny. That's great. Uh, Steve, let's talk about about your podcast for a bit. You've got a Excellent. podcast about young adults and worship. Worship, yeah. Worship. So, so you're podcast, a church guy. No, no, let's not go there. You're not a church guy. I, no. See, okay, tell me what I did there. Why did I do that? I don't um, know. I, I think you assumed worship in the traditional sense, which, I mean, I, of course you do. Everyone I considered does. people standing in front of others with a guitar, maybe a keyboard, and leading people in songs. So, yeah, I, I'm not really comfortable with the word worship because I come from a Catholic upbringing. So the whole worship thing didn't even occur to me until mm-hmm. I came down to the South. I'm from Minnesota as well. Oh. So once I ended up in Austin, Texas, I started to see the Southern Baptist worship thing going yeah. on. And, it, I mean, it's wild. There's a drummer, like, in a glass cage. Yeah. And it's like, I was, people, like, <laughs> got their hands up. Fog and it's like, lights. here we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the podcast, first of all, is called Farming God. Farming God. A farming God. In my life so far, I have had experiences playing college sports, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, and farming, um, working outdoors. I have found that my experience doing those three things have connected me with some sort of God, divine presence, more than ever sitting in a Catholic Mass. Huh. So what I'm doing now is going through alternative worship uh places wherever that may be talking to post pastors talking to mega church pastors talking to people having a three-person church in a bar on saturday nights and finding where young adults are going towards and what the church of 2050 is going to look like Mm. Mm -hmm. do you want to do you have some thoughts to tell us about oh my gosh after this weekend i'm so i I need like three days to process it all Mm -hmm. then i'll come back with Mm -hmm. some okay really good ideas (laughs) (laughs) Uh, sounds awesome you're gonna you're gonna bury that for three days and then have it come back to life (laughs) and tell us that i think think you're onto something there um so you use the word worship 
to mean uh, to mean what? Recognizing that in a lot of church settings, that's a phrase that's kind of owned by a church service, mm. right? And you don't mean it that way. You mean it. You no, mean it yeah, and I, I would what? love a different word. And it, the only reason I use this is going down the wormholes of the internet. I've come, come across like alternative worship, emerging church, missional missional worship, hmm. and it's these sort of experiential understandings of the divine, or it's it's people cleaning up their neighborhood, it's people working with poor uh, poor people that maybe having like a five minute review session or five minute uh, moment of silence or. Something like that, actually like doing something, involving their body, experiencing something, feeling something in this like dulled life that we're surrounded by on our phones and Facebook. They want to feel something. And going to church mass on Sunday, kneeling, standing, sitting, isn't going to do it for them. What is? So I don't know what that worship is. Th- what I'm meaning by that is the experience, I think, is what but I'm talking about. It for. sounds like you're getting at like uh, what the what the effect of those are on the person to help them come fully to life. Mm, yes. Is, is that is that part of it with yeah. you? Is that part of what you're talking Absolutely. about? Like how does it bring life in someone? Absolutely. And it's still completely completely developing. And I think that's uh, definitely in the right alley. It's we're finding people running 100 miles, like biking hundreds of miles. Running 100 uh, miles. Pe- people didn't that do this. So sad. Crazy. I, yeah, it's like ultra marathon. We got a guy over there. He runs 100 miles. Oh, you do too. Yeah, these freaking ultra <laughs> marathon <laughs> runners. Just these are nutcases. These like these nut jobs. Ma- <laughs> half marathons, people are half crazy. Marathons, people are crazy. Like, I don't. Ultra marathons are it's like something. Crazy. Wackadoodle is the word you're <laughs> looking for. It, but, I, hearing you talk makes me think of mysticism. Does that play a role in your thinking about this? Oh, absolutely. And I think that young adults are coming back to the mystics a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, we find find it in all the literature. They, but bringing those together into some sort of con- contemporary. You go to Thomas Merton, the the people of the desert from 400, mm-hmm. uh, 400 B.C. No, AD, AD, AD. Yep. And you find, sure, they go, can go out to the desert and have these types of experiences. That's not practical now. How can we take that knowledge from and that wisdom from the desert fathers mm. and bring them into our current mm. life and from the ancient mystics? How can we bring that into our contemporary life where the population is 7 billion and we're mm. all connected via a thing this big? Mm-hmm. So. Well, that's excellent. How often do you put out your podcast? Uh, it's about every week now, and it's it's varies in form. Sometimes it's an uh, interview. Sometimes it's more narrative based. I like the heavy editing that you don't like. Yeah, no, that's okay. No, that's that's the podcast style. I, I like it. Yeah, man. But it's yeah. like some music going on, and about once a week we're going yeah. for. It's yeah. called the farming. Excellent guy. farming guy. You can find it on the places where people find podcasts. Absolutely. Is that true? Oh, Steve, thanks for being here. You're a good, you're a good sport for just popping right in. You're not too bad either, Doug. Thanks, thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, we're going to invite uh, Liz. Liz is going to join us, too, as we swap out Steve for those of you that are sitting here. Uh, but Ben Corey, you, you've written a book, a dissertation, a book. and turned it into a book. Well, no, not quite. I wrote a book, then I wrote a dissertation, and now I'm trying to finish my next book. You wrote a book, then you wrote a dissertation, and yeah. now there's yet another book. So those Bit are three of a separate slacker. things. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> last year, I've had to write my dissertation and write my next and book ri- in the same book. period. Yeah. I, uh, are you done with the dissertation? I'm done with the dissertation. Are you a doctor? I am a doctor. Are you Dr. Oh. Benjamin Corey at this very I am moment? Dr. Benjamin L. Corey. One really? Congratulations. What, Thank is you your, sir. what is your doctorate in? Uh, my doctorate is in intercultural studies. So DIS. A doctor of intercultural studies. Yes, and what I did was I studied a theology of shalom and a whole personhood and how a theology of shalom may help us um, as in either trauma aftercare or pastorally or even relationships. How can we move towards a fullness of self and what are all the different categories that need to be complete and full in order to really and truly live the way it was intended. So, um, so it was my own take on a theology of shalom. If you were to give us like a one sentence definition of theology of Shalom. What I would just you wrote say? a sixty thousand word dissertation. I know, so yeah, can you put that in a nutshell? <laughs> make it a sound bite, Doctor. Theology ben. of Shalom uh, would be life lived as it was intended. Okay. Huh. Do you ever get any pushback from people who are from a Jewish uh, tradition about co opting Shalom in a non Jewish context? Uh, no, although no, it's it, not a no, thing. I, I know I, I haven't yet. Yeah. So, no. 
So no, no, no. Now he will. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did justice. I just didn't. I just no, don't know I think if, I that's, if that would be a thing. Term, I, I could so, see uh, that being a thing. Okay, yeah. cool. But, but yeah, no. Know. So I've been busy. So yeah, my last book was a couple of years ago, and then I had this, and uh, somehow I've been trying to figure out how to fit a dissertation and a book into yeah. one year. And so. you spend a lot of time on the internet as well. You have a significant <laughs> internet presence. Like I was walking with you the other day through uh, a series yeah. of uh, tents over here at the festival, and someone stopped you and said to you. Thank you for the work you do. You've been really important in my wife. Your blog really helped her through some very difficult. You you have a very active presence of helping people via the words you write on the internet. I try to, and I'm al I'm always really touched when uh, you know when readers stop me and introduce themselves and tell me about that. But yeah, I mean, I'm somebody who's gone through a big change in my own faith, and somewhere along the journey, I kind of realized that um, that my story is so similar to their story, and yes. so I keep telling it because I feel like it encourages them to identify their story, to own their own story, and to kind of move beyond that. So, um, so I like to do that, and I like to take a lot of the heat for them too, because uh, I can hmm. you know be a lightning rod and. Instead of them, so. if people want to find you on the internet, what's what's the name of your uh, people can find space? my well, you just Google my name, I'll come right up. But my blog is called Formerly Fundy, and it's on Pathios Progressive Christian Channel. Uh, so Formerly Fundy, and uh, you can find me there on Facebook slash Benjamin L. Corey. And, and there was uh, there was a point when you first started Formerly Fundy blog, yeah. it went like bananas by blog standards, right? Wasn't there something where like yeah. fifty people or more or something like that, a hundred <laughs> oh, people? Oh no, no, I yeah, I just started blogging out, you know, because I was bored. Yeah. In 2013, yeah, and I just wrote a couple of blogs, thinking I was writing, you know, for like 10 people. Yeah, and my third blog that I wrote had over 100,000 shares. I know, 100,000. <laughs> 100, <laughs> yeah. Wow, and Benz. after th and the, it, then it never stopped, and so it's just been. It just stays up like that all the yeah, time. Yeah, literally hundreds of thousands a month every month. So it's been kind of fun. Um, yeah, yeah. I do mean, you um, do you do you make any money off that? Not to get personal, but just for people <laughs> who wonder about that, like, is that enough? To, to fund that, someone's Dr. life to uh, be a blogger? Well, I wouldn't say it can fund your life. There are maybe people who monetize better than me, but um, I work for Pathios, who yeah. is monetized, so I get yeah. paid royalties. Um, and I'll say that I, I pay my rent with yeah. my blog. Does right. it fund your life, even though it doesn't <laughs> fund your <laughs> life? It pays my rent. That's pretty <laughs> good. It pays your rent, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, so, so for people who really are thinking, like, hey, maybe that's a way uh, in the new economy and in the globally yeah. connected Internet world. Definitely. It's certainly possible. They have this saying now that blogging is dead. And I don't believe it's dead, but it is certainly harder to, it's certainly harder to amass a big presence for yourself. I'm like totally lucky, and that's why I'm just I enjoy it. I know if it goes away one day, I'll be okay. Um, but yeah, why? Because I, people are like Facebook, or it's. I think it's one of those things. Is, it's gotten oversaturated. Like I used to be, a, I was a professional wedding photographer for ten years, and the market just kept getting oversaturated because with the invention of digital cameras, and they got cheaper, and then before you, everybody's a photographer. Yeah, and so it kind of waters it down. Um, so I think you just have to, you know, try a little harder but it's totally totally possible because i did it just two years ago and things are still going strong yeah. but my advice is if you know you have something to say and you say it well and and if you can here's the real trick if you can say what somebody else thinks or feels but cannot articulate for themselves you're going to be good because hmm. uh. what i do is i try to say what they're thinking but don't, are not able to articulate huh. yet, mm -hmm. and I try to give them the words to do that. I try to write things that are so much more clever. The person says, uh, "I never could have thought that." So you're suggesting cool that's not the way to <laughs> <laughs> make money on the internet <laughs> to make I, people no, feel like I've, I've never even thought of that well, before. Well, you write wow, good stuff really too. <laughs> In fact, man, the last time no, we were together, yes. like that was awesome because we actually s basically serenaded somebody. Do you remember in that? Yeah, I that do. was a great was story. Awesome. You serenaded <laughs> someone in Starbucks. Yeah, we were doing. I was doing a book event in Maine. And a woman uh, who goes to the, play, the church that this event was going to be hosted at said, oh, my friend can't make it tonight but because uh, she had to work. She works at the Starbucks down the street. So yeah. we said, let's go down there and get a musician with me. So we went down to her yeah. store. I gave her a book. But then she sees you. Well, Wasn't see, that she, the story? Well, sort of, yeah, almost. Did I have the story wrong? Because she saw you well, and was I like, <laughs> hey, you're Ben Corey. You're like a super <laughs> famous guy. It was the greatest well, moment. I had an, I had, I had, so I actually plugged your book tour on my fan page. And somebody commented, oh, my gosh, that's right down the street from where I work. I would totally love to go and see oh, you guys. I'm working at Starbucks. Yeah. So that's when I, so I grabbed one of my books. And so yes. that's I told you, dude, yeah. let's go see this this girl at Starbucks. And so we walked in. and She man, just oh thought her. God. So we both gave her autographed books. Yeah, and, well, um, and she remembers one. 
one of us Heather being Lynn. there, Ben Corey. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> it, was oh, yeah. very, it was a very fun moment. No, that um, was awesome. So, yeah, yeah, we had a lot of fun. All right, so you've got this other book coming out. You've still decided that you should uh, write books in that old style of, like, uh, have a title and write 50 or 60,000 words and have a closing chapter and all that instead yeah. of the ongoing, unfolding nature of the Internet. Yeah, I, I, I love books. I love being able to take yeah. something with you. I want people, and plus, you know, um, I approach books in a slightly different way than I approach blogs. Like in, in blogs, I'm trying to make do some commentary. I may push some lines that I may yeah. not push in a book. When I write a book, um, I'm really, I'm even a lot more careful with my words. I'm writing something that I know a blog will come and go, but I know my books will be read when I'm dead and that my kids are going to read them. And so with my books, I write something that I imagine if my children are having a faith crisis 30 years from now and if I'm not around we'll you just probably <laughs> caused it you know <laughs> yeah. no pressure <laughs> wow so <laughs> no yeah and so uh, no, the book you. I'm yeah the book I'm working on now kind of the the uh, subtitle that we're working with that we just uh, kind of uh, put, picked the other day was um, how to find faith when everything you believed is no longer true anymore huh. yeah mm -hmm. and so um, so it's really about going through a midlife crisis and, and when it has a strong component of faith um, so a midlife faith crisis and like when you you're just not sure what you believe anymore. Um, how do you go through and name those things you don't believe in a way that gives you new life? Hmm. Um, because I believe that there is, so for example, I was going through a, a really difficult time. And so I had Rob Bell on my podcast and I asked Rob, I said, so what would you say to somebody who isn't sure what they believe anymore? And Rob said, you know, I'd say it's not true that you don't know what you believe anymore. <laughs> he said, what is true is hmm. that right now in this moment, you're just acutely aware of some things that you no longer do believe. <laughs> and so this was like, I had been going through just this big crash in my own life. And it's as if like Rob just turned the light bulb on. <laughs> like, wait a minute. It's not that I don't know what I believe. I actually, it's that I just know some things I I don't believe anymore, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and, and that's, there's power in naming that. And mm -hmm. so the book is kind of naming that, like, I don't believe in a God that I have to be scared of anymore. And I name that. And yeah. so, mm -hmm. and, and what's, and what's left under it, you know, you turn away from fear and then you have love. And, mm -hmm. and what are the thing? what are the messages I was taught about myself growing up? Yeah. Um, that I wasn't worthy of being loved. And mm -hmm. that when even best case scenario that when God sees me, he doesn't see me, he sees Jesus and how mm -hmm. I internalized it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't worthy of being seen and be yeah. having intimacy. And so mm -hmm. I've been a total failure in my relationships all my life mm -hmm. and so i'm like you know what i don't believe that about me anymore yeah. mm -hmm. and, and there's so much power in naming what you don't believe and so yeah. that's the next book yeah and mm -hmm. wh when when can people buy it well people will be able to buy it. so it's supposed to come out next fall but um my editor tells me that if we have a reason to push that up we can probably do that so i'm secretly what hoping if the dozen people listening to this podcast really <laughs> really want it before next fall is that reason <laughs> enough that people could that well, your publisher would push it up I'm we all I'm write I'm letters. I'm going to ask Harper one if maybe next year at Wild Goose we can do an early launch. That yeah, would be awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I'm going to ask them if that's going to be possible. Please So, consider. it's a Harper One book. Harper One book. That's For people that right know on. that or care about publishers, that's, a uh, that's, the, that's the publisher. The title's set. The artwork is done. The things Negative. that matter to a lot of author <laughs> <laughs> authors. The book cover design is I all done. I only have the subtitle, <laughs> and I don't yeah. have a main title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, no. I'll, yeah, for me, when the artwork is done, that's the big moment. I, isn't for that? Me. A, yeah, that's it's like, oh, this is really yeah, happening. That's right. You know, yep. it's like, yeah. it's not enough to like get in advance and stuff like that, because mm -hmm. that's just kind of like borrowing money from the mafia. They yes. can come <laughs> back and take you, know, break yeah. your legs if you don't yeah, produce. Yeah. Uh, but like seeing the artwork and the cover, that's like, this is happening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like seeing the wedding dress. It is. Yeah. It's spectacular. Like so this I is can't happening. wait for that moment. So yeah. I'm hoping for it. Well, well I, for one, can't wait to read it. I oh, I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. so much. So. Mm -hmm. Hello, Liz, hey. who's just joined us. Normally in uh, Doug Padgett Radio World, we get little commercial breaks in between. We'll just pretend one of those happened. <laughs> uh, thanks, buddy. Elizabeth, thanks for, uh, th thanks for being with us. Um, we are interviewing people who uh, here at Wild Goose who are doing such interesting things that need to be heard from but don't yet have a platform. And among the more interesting things going on, because you know I'm a big fan of yours, you uh, is, is <laughs> what you're doing. So I don't want to overhype it, but I just think it's so great, right? Like um, we live in this in this age in which – People joining lives together in order to imagine the kind of world they want to live in with being able to knowledge, story, a whole new way of life and all this is really important. And only some people have the opportunity or interest or uh, maybe uh, capability to rally up a bunch of people and start something from nothing. 
mm-hmm. uh, especially a community of people that are going to stay together. And all of that mm-hmm. stuff tends to be called like starting a church, right? That's kind of the, the <laughs> that's simple. The, that's the language I'm u- that the people keep telling me I'm using. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you church that, planting. Yeah, yes. you're your church planting, which is, I mean, it's a great, it's a great term, but it doesn't really tell you really what's, uh, tell a person really what's going on. But uh, so, so give us a little, a, a little recap. You're starting a, a new church or it has started is a better way to say it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think I almost like the terms culture maker mm-hmm. and midwife better nice. than church planter. Right um, so so l- last fall I started seminary, and um, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with someone I really admire doing church planting, and that got me over this hump of, like, I'm not good enough, I'm not educated enough, I'm not smart enough whatever enough to be able to start a church what what was it about that conversation Mm. that led you that way you're like hey you're not all that smart confident or good so i could probably do this she totally is she totally is um but but the way she talked about it made it accessible it Uh made me feel like oh i can do that like not that church planting isn't a huge thing because it totally is but i think it's that like um being able to see inside what it actually is made yes. it seem much more accessible. Yep. Mm-hmm. So after this conversation with her, I met with some folks in my denomination, which is a really small Anabaptist pietist denomination called Church of the Brethren, mostly in sort of upper Midwest area. And and I wrote this proposal for a church plant because, and I asked for funding because I think that in our culture, church, new church starts need to be funded in order for them to be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, having someone try and do it like on the weekends and the evenings of their like two other jobs while they're like doing a bunch of different stuff just isn't sustainable Mm -hmm. for most successful church plant so i asked for money they gave it to me i was able to leave my job that i was doing at the time what what, what job were you doing i was a church administrator a glorified Mm -hmm. church administrator (laughs) (laughs) so i was you know doing like the detaily stuff At, at a church of the brethren kind of church UCC Presbyterian. Okay. So do a little denominational hopping. So um, you went back to your f- your the denomination of your family. My family denomination. My dad's a pastor. I was born and raised, and already already doing um, denominational work to push our denomination to be inclusive of LGBT folks, women, minorities of all kinds. How is that going? It's tough work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. But part of the church plant was to sort of say, um, we're struggling on an institutional level to move forward, so I am just going to start doing church. Mm. I'm going to not wait for the institution to give me permission to Mm. do it. I'm just going to start it. And I'm really lucky that I live in a geographic area of our denomination where that flies. If I was any other place in the country, it wouldn't fly. Which is where? Where do you live? Pacific Northwest. So I'm in Olympia, Washington. Um, I suppose I should say the church is called Wildwood Gathering. Mm-hmm. Wildwood Gathering. Wildwood it's a Gathering. Great name. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Like yeah. Um, so, so being able to be supported by the district in that area, going back to my denominational roots, um, and and claiming a space in my denomination for this new way, returned way of being church. So, uh, like in the Church of the Brethren world, how many women church planters have there been in the last ten years? In the last ten years. There's two others that I know of doing church plants right now, uh, both in Chicago area, Chicagoland. Um, prior to that, I can't think of any. And now that may just be my so here Liz lack of pops knowledge. in and Liz yeah. is like, hey, I want to be one of those people that do that that does that. And, and on top of it, you have some other c- uh, issues that have tended to keep you from being a church. Yeah, church. <laughs> how many of those uh, church how planters are in the L- LGBTQ community? Yeah. So the dominant. Well, you know, the denomination currently does not license or ordain LGBT folks, and. Um, Again, because I'm just going to mention for the people who are maybe listening to the podcast right now that we're at the Wild Goose Festival, which is in the hills of of uh, North Carolina. And every day at this time, just before the torrential rains come in, uh, (laughs) there's a train that comes riding by, uh, railing by. And um, because there's a street intersection, it blows its horn, which for every podcast that is that is uh, at the four o'clock slot. Yeah. There's a little commercial break. It also comes roaring through For about real. 4 o'clock in the morning it as well. Does. Oh, nice. I feel like it's coming right through my tent. Very yeah. special. Yeah, and they blow that horn, too, don't they? Yeah. They do. Every time. There it is. 
All right. So in the in the denomination that you're in, they're not um, currently able to give pastoral powers, which they call ordaining someone to LGBTQ category of people. Yeah. So uh, and 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 I will I will the language that our denomination is wrestling with is um, whether it is. Um, a, represent a representative of a Christ-like life to be living a homosexual lifestyle, mm. to be practicing a homosexual lifestyle, right? So you can be gay, but you can't be practicing, and I use yeah. air quotes, like whatever practicing means. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm working within the denomination on with a bunch of other amazing progressive people who have been doing this for decades to help shift this policy. But... Mm -hmm we're really having a hard time like a lot of other denominations are you know where our denomination is not alone in this the methodists are in the middle of it the yeah. mennonites are totally in the middle of it mm -hmm. presbyterians have been there yep. they're in the middle of the actual like splitting process now mm -hmm. so like we're definitely not alone but we're definitely deep in the throes right. of trying to figure out how we live together in christ um when our theologies differ and how we understand and understand the bible yeah. differ mm -hmm. so greatly and so how did they uh uh, how do they take to you starting a church? Well, uh, so the district is super supportive. They've got my back. Um, I've gotten a really wonderful, positive reception from a lot of people. I've got a lot of support, people who are really encouraging what I'm, what I'm doing and the ministry that I'm undertaking. Um, but I'm also kind of quiet about it. I haven't really talked about it until I'm on... Doug Patrick. Yeah, Doug Patrick is going to um, gonna blow them away. We have a lot of Church of the Brethren listeners. <laughs> you do now. Um, so so we'll, we'll see. And I don't know. I don't know what, what well, will. Well, it's a very exciting and brave thing yeah. you're doing. Yeah. But I also sort of say I'm going to do this and I'm going to stand here and do this. And um, church planners all over the country aren't ordained, don't have ordinations That's and right. denominations. Like there's That's tons right. of non-denominational. Mm -hmm. I want to do this because I think the Church of the Brethren represents uh, something really incredible about yeah. our denominational life together. Um, so I want to yeah. yeah. share that. But yes. Yeah. Well, for, for whatever it's worth, there are some people out there who uh, want to encourage you to keep doing that. And we'll leave, I'd be one of those that would even say that ordination sometimes is part of the problem. So don't bow your knee mm -hmm. to that to that system if yeah yeah if you don't have to okay so tell us a little bit about the about the the name uh the the wild yeah. wild wood gathering wood so gathering um i actually kind of want to do something with a play on like wild geese but mm -hmm. you know it's kind of already taken with this whole festival thing so <laughs> i couldn't get a url um you know if you do pick it up i got a goose for you <laughs> <laughs> so so but i played one. with um this i was playing with uh the wildness of god right so yeah. the wildness of god the untamedness of god and the intersections of uh, particularly those who who struggle with church and institutions of church often find nature and nice. the the woods or the forest to be a sacred space. So the sacred groundedness we find in the woods. So the intersections of um, spirituality, faith, yeah. church, wildness. That's great. So, that, so that's how you describe it now, I'm sure. Where did that phrase come to you? Do you remember where you were when you I first? I do. Um, and it, and I I was sitting so. At the backup. So I knew when I started a church, I wanted to do some awesome videography. I wanted to do some awesome storytelling through video. So I found this guy randomly on Instagram, Logan Martin, who actually is the brother of another crazy church planter. Um, hmm. and, and actually is how I kind of got hooked in with this whole thing. But so Logan, I shot him an, in, an Instagram uh, message and uh, he does Tailwind vi visuals video. And and I said, so I'm doing this crazy thing. Would you be willing to work with me? And he's like, yes, I'll be in the Olympia area on this day. We met up for coffee and we hit it off. He agreed to work with me. Amazing process. And we're sitting in my living room a couple weeks later. And he, like, we're there to shoot the video like that we've been talking about. And he's like, so what's your name? And I was like, I don't, I, I don't have one. Like, I can't. So he's like, what's the name? <laughs> like, that's kind of a <laughs> starting <laughs> point. Right. Like, I don't, I don't. Is he totally shocked at this point? That you're he <laughs> wasn't. His response was, okay, so what do you, like, what do you want to play with? So oh, we spent great. like 20 minutes playing with names. And I told him like the Mary Oliver, Wild Goose, Wild yeah. Geese yeah. poem, how important that was. And. And we actually, we live in a neighborhood that's called Wildwood. But the name isn't necessarily a geographic name. Yeah. But I think it definitely inspired both of us as we were sitting there throwing ideas back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, our coffee shop is, like, in the Wildwood neighborhood. 
Great. So, so that's where it came from, and, and it was definitely this sort of collaborative conversation of what I was thinking, and he was the ab- able to sort of take the pieces that I was talking about and put them together. Mm-hmm. And the poem you're referencing is a really famous, lo- much loved poem. What will you do with your one wild and precious life? That's right? Mary Oliver. But that's the Mary poem Oliver. That I'm talking about is not that one. This is like the. Um, Oh crap! I'm not going to be able to remember it now. But it's like, um, you do not have to be. You don't have to walk a thousand miles on your knees. You do not have to. Uh, it's just. It's all about like. Oh, I can't remember it. But it's amazing. So wild geese, Mary Oliver. Back when we all have internet again, right? We, we don't can look it up. <laughs> we don't have these any at the goose. Know, and we know where we know them. We can know them again. Either someday way, we will know right. and it's be awesome. fully known. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's on. It's on one of the. If you walk towards the main stage, it's, oh yeah, it's written on one of these giant mm. like wooden boards. So have you started already? If we somebody s- shows up in Olympia, Washington on Sunday, can they go to a wild wood gathering? Not on Sunday, but on Thursday. On Thursday, you meet on Thursdays. You meet on Thursdays. Um, awesome. Why is that? Are you a uh, so we just had a bunch fourth day Adventist. <laughs> 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 we we no, uh, no had Adventist? a group of folks that wanted to start, and I said, "What day is best?" And they said, "How about Thursday?" And I said, "Sure." That's great. <laughs> so we're this on Thursday. Make every may you make every decision for the <laughs> life of this church with that very same impulse. When what do you want to do? When you want to do it? Sure, sure, let's go. And yeah, so I I was making this proposal, and I I wanted to. Um, I had this like people really want to just start meeting mm-hmm. and so I was like okay let's let's do it in my living room let's pick Thursdays at 7 30 and and let's just start love it um so wild wildwood gathering Thursdays at 7 30 in my living room um and uh I don't we'll we'll we're looking for like a permanent like more permanent location that's not my living room because so I do I do this with with folks who are spiritual refugees and like people who really struggle with church yeah and so it's hard to go to church, mm-hmm. even for someone who's churched, yes. who grew yeah. up church. Yes. It's yeah. hard to go to a new church and to find a new church. So right now, folks have to, like, find me on the Internet, mm-hmm. send me a Facebook message or an email. I have Great. to get in touch with them and tell them where we're meeting, give them my home address, yeah. drive through a dark neighborhood or a you know, strange neighborhood, knock on a stranger's door to come to church. That's a whole lot of barriers. Yeah. So I'm trying to get financial resources and identify a location in Olympia where we can meet that's more accessible so once we do that then we'll open up we may change days at that point sure but it'll also open up people who have kids it'll give us more opportunity to bring in more folks um so i sort of say we're in a soft opening but Mm -hmm. great well well whenever you have the option for us to become honorary members oh yeah we'd like to do that y'all can come out and visit us anytime so that's what you say that all starts with a contribution your response to that every time is and you can make your membership (laughs) contribution at (laughs) 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 www.wildwoodgathering.org wildwoodgathering.org is that what it is wildwoodgathering.org if anybody listening to this wants to support what you're doing because they think it's great they could do that at wildwoodgathering.org wildwoodgathering.org yeah I hope they do yeah yes Go to the website. Thank you. All right. Thank Liz. you so much. Michael Toy, we only have a couple of minutes. Can you uh, redeem all of this with some of your beautiful poetry? Michael uh, Michael Toy, the number four best-selling poet in uh, spir- religious, and uh, religious inspirational, poet. inspirational poet in North America. Mm-hmm. There we go. Yes, I can. I will give you a choice, Doug. Yes. I have uh, Thank you. the poem that you have to write because people are dying, or I have something light and fun. Mm. You, how do you want to in? Wow. Well, it makes me sound sound shallow, but how about uh, light and fun? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> I, I think it's sort of sort of yeah, it's, it's sort of the, the 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 rich dark beer or the light summery ale. Okay. No. And in light of this, let's go with the light summery ale. Okay. <laughs> Michael Toy, this comes out of your best selling book. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a little secret for you all: uh, if you self publish a book of poetry and you get thirty of your friends um, to buy it on the first day that it comes out. <laughs> um, and 30 is the magic number, then if you, and you publish it in an obscure category, such as spiritual and inspirational poetry, <laughs> you can be a bestseller on that day. <laughs> and I have a it's screenshot true. <laughs> of my computer. There's the proof. There's evidence. The four yeah. best religious and inspirational poets in America were Khalil Gibran, Walt Whitman, and me. <laughs> 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 Which is true. Okay, so here's a poem. This is a, this is a benediction poem. Um, I wrote this poem angry because my church was working its way through the book of Acts as if it were a wonderful thing Mm -hmm. uh, to be reading about these things that we don't experience anymore. Um, And then as I wrote it in anger, it turned out that there was something beautiful about that. And so it's called The Wasteland. Somewhere between the gate called Beautiful, where the lame man walked, and the day called Wonderful, where the last tear is dried and the dancing starts, wander a people who tell stories of wind filling a room with fire. 
They stumble through a wasteland, the world rendered scorched and barren by the stories of life so rich that everything within reach seems withered by the words. It's a vast desert dotted with an occasional insufficient oasis. Now there's a river, but it's a river of justice running so wide and deep that when they dip their hands in it for cooling, it runs through their fingers dry pebbles and dust. And they're surrounded by a freedom so boundless that the horizon a life's walk away seems a prison in perspective. No lament is deep enough to fill the chasm between the utterances which shake the pillars of creation and the timid noises which they hope at best will not spend their brief time echoing as lies. These stories, too beautiful for words, a hope, too hungry for the fuel of a beated heart or even all hearts beating together, yet still they sing with joy unjustified, drink deep when water can be found, mm. carrying what extra they can shoulder should they stumble upon someone thirsty, leaving footprints, impressions of truth, seedlings of green sprouting in the places where they strode and swung their weight forwards, mm. step by step. They write across the wasteland a version of the story which names the heartless desert as untruth. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Michael Toy, Doug Badger Radio, <laughs> Wild Goose Festival 2016. Thank you, Victoria. Peace out, everybody. Over and out. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Thank you all for Thank coming. Thank you, Miguel. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And uh, don't forget fun. that in about a half hour, we're going to do it again, isn't it? The uh, homebrew culture tab. You guys. If you've never heard that before, it's going to be lots of fun there. At least two special guests. <laughs> Secret, I can't, I can't divulge who they are. You might be able to guess who they are, but I can't, I can't divulge. So, do come back. And also, there was, Doug's been talking about podcasts. We have two podcasters on, on this, this uh, podcast. And tomorrow morning, uh, yeah, tomorrow morning, Trip Fuller will be here for two hours from 9 to 11, doing workshops, kind of a double workshop. One on why you should start a podcast. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Russ. All right, I gotta run, go listen to Carla.